Well, hello, and uh, welcome to this episode of On the Mic with Mike. But today we're at Simon Fraser University and we're in the games room. Uh, we're going to be talking with Joy Johnson, who's the vice president of research here, who's had an amazing career, but also is helping steer the ship of Simon Fraser University as it moves forward in, in its academic uh, mandate. So I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a great discussion, but uh, in, the, in a few moments, because I actually have a really great score going on here. So we got to kind of finish up a little bit. Talk to you in a few minutes. Thank you for joining us on this episode of uh, On the Mic with Mike. Uh, as you know, this is really a bit of a, just a conversation around your career and advice to young people who might be thinking about mm -hmm. similar. So can you just tell us a little bit, of, what are you doing now? Um, I'm the Vice President of Research and International at Simon Fraser University. And in that role, I help support research uh, across the university and all disciplines across all of our faculties, making sure that they, our researchers have the supports they need to be successful. And I also um, um, have the international office reporting to me. So looking for opportunities for our, our faculty and our students to be engaged internationally uh, through research collaborations, faculty exchange, student exchange. Right. So that's got to be kind of thrilling for you. I, mean, I, was, I was just, you know, I was looking at some data just the other day that came through from Stats Canada that's talking about the distribution of our younger professoriate, mm -hmm. the numbers, yeah. and you know, no surprise, we're seeing less. Yeah. Um, but then a sort of a shift towards an older demographic. So in your role, how much do you get to mold and help those young investigators be successful and move forward? Well, ultimately, um, we want to see all of our investigators be successful. Okay. But I think in particular, when um, new faculty come um, to SFU, right. Uh, you know, they're learning about a new institution. They need to, some of them are coming from outside of Canada. Right. So need to learn more about the granting councils, need to learn more about um, just the mechanisms, the ecosystem here, and right. how they can be successful. And as you know, collaboration is so important right. now for um, researchers, so to figure out how they can create connections. And so that's part of the role that we play, for sure. Right. So, you, and you mentioned you, you've got the international portfolio, but you also, in your answer, just also mention that you, could, you have international recruitments coming in. Here. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people, I think, don't realize that our hunting ground for new faculty and stuff is really worldwide now for expertise. How does that play out for you? Well, um, ultimately, if you want to be an excellent university um, and tr attract top talent, um, you know, we rely on a number of great Canadian universities to recruit um, top faculty members, graduates from our PhD and postdoc programs, but also internationally it's really important now as well. Um, to and, and that's wonderful for a variety of reasons um, because these are excellent researchers that come to SFU um, bringing different perspectives from their countries, but they also bring a tie back to their country very often and so it helps us build bridges internationally as well, thinking about connections that we can develop. And that sort of international, I mean it's, a, it's an area we, heard, you know, we talk about a lot, we talk about a lot at the CIHR in terms of the strength and the need for those. And yet many times, you know, some of the conversations that I'll have are that you know, we should be putting our resources in, into home, mm. not really seeing the value add of, well, these international linkages are really critical. So how, how do you navigate that? Because not everybody agrees that we should be as strongly international as we are. Well, my argument is that um, science and scholarship doesn't know boundaries or borders. Right. Um, and that um, you know, great science um, often does need this type of international collaboration because of the perspective that gets brought, because of the different um, connections. Um, I also think that um, particularly in, in this era um, where there are so many divisions across countries among right. state, um, state units, uh, I do believe that academia has a role to play in diplomacy, in creating border, uh, uh, crossing borders as right. well. So, so often when our, our politicians can't find a way, right. our scientists can. Mm. And so that's also so important for us as a nation, for right. Canada, and also for the world. So do you think, so you've had a really interesting pathway to get mm -hmm. here, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and SFU is really growing. I mean, it's really striking, you know, the amount of changes that are happening with this. So how has all of that helped to inform how you're guiding the research mantle here? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's interesting to kind of think about my trajectory. Yeah. You know, um, my first degree was in nursing, and I worked as a nurse for five years. 
um, before I went back to graduate school. And it was really in graduate school that I got the research bug and decided that I was interested in an academic career, a research career. Right. Um, and then had time at CIHR as yep. a scientific director, as well as having been a faculty member at UBC for a number of years. And all of that informs what I'm doing today in a variety of different ways. Um, I think that, um, you know, certainly uh, as a nurse, for example, I was, it was really important to understand the social kind of um, dynamics of health, but also to understand the physical, understand the physiology and how it affects right. um, health outcomes for people. Um, so kind of being a, already um, in my professional, early professional life, having to think both about the biopsychosocial right. elements situates me to talk to a variety of different scientists. Right. And then um, I'd say my own, um, it's important to have been a researcher myself and a productive researcher myself to understand what it's like to build a right, right. program of research, to have been rejected um, you know, many <laughs> yes. times um, yes. in the, from a granting council or from a, a, a paper that's been um, submitted for publication. All of those experiences inform um, how I see my role today. Um, because it gives me a lot of compassion right. um, for the research community. I do see where the opportunities lie as well because of that. And um, I would say also, and kind of coming back to CIHR, it was really as a scientific director at CIHR that I also really learned strategy, um, learned yeah. about the ways in which we need to build platforms, build opportunities um, for our research community. Right. So you mentioned that at the beginning, you used the phraseology where I caught the bug yeah. to do research, right? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to ask people about, mm -hmm. was there a seminal moment, right, or a seminal person uh, that gave you that bug? That, or was it just a constellation of things? Yeah, for me it was probably a little bit more of a constellation. You know, I initially went back to graduate school because I was going to do a master's and I thought, oh, maybe I'll go into hospital administration or something okay. like that. And this would allow me to do that. Um, and it was really, um, I did my uh, master's and PhD at the University of Alberta, and it was really kind of a, a, a bit of a magical time. They were just starting the very first PhD program in the country in nursing. Yes, okay. So just, you know, being part of that, there was a lot of excitement and um, really amazing scholars who were inspiring in terms of thinking about the opportunities um, yeah. for health research, for nursing research as well. And I just saw so many possibilities. Right. Um, so it was really that that constellation of really exciting times that made me think and, yeah. and understand what the possibilities would be. So that's interesting because, you know, as we're starting to look at new uh, training programs, right? For instance, bringing back a clinician scientist program yeah. and what that looks like, we're being very careful to make sure that that de definition is not restrictive to an MD pool, yeah. but rather to a much broader area. But I'm, what I'm still finding and particularly a lot of my colleagues are within the nursing field, is this concept that there is a part of nursing which will lead to academia and research mm. and then success in that is still, yeah, but that's kind of unusual, mm. right? It doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say if you had a group of nurses, students who are with you right now and, and wanted to know, what would your advice be thinking about a career like yours or thinking about what are the academic drivers that I could get into going through nursing. Yeah, I think that so often, and, and this is why I went into nursing, is I yeah. wanted to, you know, I was really interested in um, serving the public. Um, I had a lot of compassion for people who were ill. I really was interested in health issues, and I think that's the initial motivation. Okay. Um, but um, I think a lot of um, people who go into nursing now also are really interested in the career opportunities. And they don't, as to your point, always think about the opportunities um, in terms of research. Right. And so, so I think there's a few things that need to happen. One is I think we need to introduce, um, you know, it's important to have role models out there. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that's important. I, and I think there's a lot more embedding around um, thinking about research evidence, thinking about research in all of our nursing curricula now. Right. And um, I, I do think, um, you know, to see those pathways. I mean, that's why nursing is such a great career right now is that there are yeah, so many right. pathways and so many opportunities, yeah. so. So if you were, you know, if you were in a position of thinking about what would I have done differently, mm. right? And, and we all do this at some point, yeah. look back on it. Um, is there anything you might have done differently to, to prepare you for where you are now? Well, to, you know, to prepare me prepare for where I am. And the second question will be, and if you did something yeah. else. 
You know, I don't, it's interesting. I mean, um, I don't know any five-year-old who wakes up and says, I want to be a vice president research in international right. when I grow up. Yeah. It's kind of not, you know. Uh, not a highlight? Not, yeah, it's, <laughs> and it's not, like, because, like, who would think yeah. about doing that, right? right. But I, I'm thrilled to be in this role. I've really enjoyed it, and I do think um, it, there were a series of stepping stones that allowed me to get to this place. Right. Could there have been other stepping stones? Maybe. Right. Um, but I, 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 it's interesting to think about what else would have helped me get to this place. Right. I, I really, I think CHR was, was great, being a professor was great. All right. of those pieces, taking on leadership roles in the university, really right. important. Um, but, and all of them prepared me to get to where right. I am today. So I, yeah, yeah. nothing really comes to mind, I have to say. Which is fair, well, you know, it's, it's, there's sort of a common thread that I hear along those lines, too, is that... I didn't, as you say, I didn't wake up when I was five years old and say, gee, I want to be doing this. Yeah. Without, I didn't even wake up when I was 30 and, you yeah. know, for certain ways. Oh, no, totally. Right. But there's that ability to say, you know what, let's just see what happens. Like, take that path. Yeah. Um, and were there times during this pathway where you made a conscious decision to say, I, I really do want to go down this pathway? Or was it very much of, that's fascinating, I'd like to try that. Yeah. So, um, it's such an interesting comment because, um, for me, um, I had been very successful as a professor at UBC. I had a big program of research. We had a lot of research funding, had a great team, um, was a full professor. And it was really at that point I thought, hmm, what next? Yes, okay. You know, what, what else am I really interested in? And I'm, I am a builder. I really like to build teams. I really like to build opportunities. And I started to think about where those next opportunities okay. would be. So I had my eye on CIHR, I have to say. Okay. Um, and so that was really, um, I, I, I was, and I have in my career looked for the, that next okay. opportunity. Um, and it's interesting because uh, particularly when I talk to women and their careers, mm -hmm. um, I really encourage them to apply for jobs that they might not get even. You know, like if right. you don't benchmark yourself, if you don't put yourself out mm -hmm. there, you're not going to know if you're going get, to get those right. positions. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 that's been part of my trajectory as right. well, is, is to take the risk, apply to be scientific director at CIHR, right. apply to be vice president of research and international right. at SFU, and, 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 and follow the flow, see what leads, um, right. leads to the next opportunity. So let's talk a little bit about next opportunities, but mm -hmm. in a more broader sense, yeah. right? So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is that, so we're going through a really interesting period in science and public understanding of yeah. the value of science right yeah. now. Um, and, I, and it touches all spheres. It touches uh, clinical practice all the way through to our research component. How do you see the role of universities, particularly academically research intensive universities, in maybe helping to steer this ship a bit of the public understanding of what we do in science mm. or why it's so important that we do it in an unfettered way uh, for it? And then what the real value add of you know, just simply having the right data to make decisions on comes forward. Because mm. there's a little bit of a, of a wall up there you know, about not really what we need. Mm. So as you think about universities moving forward, right, how would you see that role changing? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, to start with at Simon Fraser University, um, the vision that we've taken on is the university is to be an engaged university, right. engaged in our community, engaged in our world. And part of that is about finding ways to make sure that the, the knowledge we generate, the knowledge we mobilize is meaningful and can make a difference in the world. Right. Do that in partnership with our communities, do that in partnership with industry, but to really think about, and, and to your point, there definitely we're living in an era where there's a lot of doubting taking place around the nature of evidence, this quote post-truth era right. is challenging all of us. And so um, I think more and more it is the responsibility of the research community of universities um, to not just generate knowledge and publish in peer-reviewed publications, but we have an obligation to help the public understand the value of the work that we're doing and also to leverage that value to kind of take that mm -hmm. next step in terms of taking great ideas and transforming um, those ideas for good in society. Right. I mean, I think we've got to, I believe that universities have a public contract to do that and um, we see it done across a number of universities, but we need to do that more. Right. And that's why this knowledge mobilization work is so important. Our obligations around open science, open data are so important because uh, that will help us get to where we need to go. So what do you think the next big frontiers? I mean, you're in a, you're a VPR, mm -hmm. right? So you must be thinking about this a lot, about 
you know, investments in science going forward. Yeah. And, and I really use the term science in a very broad, yeah. broad basis of this. So if you were looking forward and thinking about where you'd be making investments uh, to actually get to where you're describing, but also move us forward as a country from a research, where would you invest? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm actually very keen on some of these new opportunities that are emerging for kind of large, transformative, multidisciplinary mm -hmm. teams. I think, I think that is a really interesting area for investment um, because I think, I think some of the wicked problems mm -hmm. that we're going to have to deal with in health um, are going to really need a variety of different perspectives. Right. And so that is an area I would think about for sure. Um, I think, you know, in terms of where I would invest, it, I think it depends on whether I'd invest as a granting council mm -hmm. or, or invest as a university. Right. Okay. And so for us as a university, we look to where our strengths are and look for where we can build, build strength as well. And so that should be a very data-informed decision, um, thinking, and that's what we try to do. We try to look at ways that we can create clusters of, um, of researchers here at SFU um, in areas that we might be able to build on. And some of the, you know, and no surprise to you, some of, mm. I think, the big bets into the future are things like artificial intelligence, mm. and that's so relevant for health, yeah. as we know, machine learning, precision health. Um, we know that's going to be very important. Uh, and we've been really pushing our advanced research computing analytics because as well that crosses all areas of the university, all areas of interest, mm -hmm. and there's so much data out there that we're not utilizing. Right. And so there's so much opportunity there as well. So that's another area that, that we're particularly keen about. Mm -hmm. And you know, we also look for the, we're, we also look for where the opportunities are, are, are emerging. So our province just announced that they're going to be interested in um, building quantum um, opportunities right. um, here in British Columbia. And um, so we're looking at, we've got quite a bit of strength in that area, and we're looking at how can we build on that right. investment now as well. So kind of pivoting to where the opportunities are, but also thinking where our own strengths right. are going to be as well. Yeah. So I, I was going to ask you, but I think I know the answer, but I was going to ask you, gee, if you could do it all over again and you did some other pathway, would there be something you'd be interested in? I suspect I know the answer, but I'm still asking. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, you know, I, I changed my mind about that. I mean, I love my job. Let, yeah. let me be clear. I love my job. But, you know, I'm also, I'm one of these people, I mean, I read a book and I think, oh, I'd love to do that. Right. Or I, you know, I see, I go, you know, um, I go, um, for example, I had an opportunity to go um, to France with um, some of our earth science researchers and, you know, climb up a volcano there with them. And I thought, oh, my God, this is so <laughs> interesting. You know, the yes. natural world is so yes. amazing. Um, so I think that, um, you know, while I love what I'm doing, you know, you know, wouldn't it have been great to be a volcanologist, right, you know, enough. like who knows, right? <laughs> um, and I just never thought about those opportunities. You know, right. it's interesting how one's path kind of goes yeah. down in a particular direction. Um, and, and in some ways, I'm, I'm very happy with where I've landed, but I, I think there could have been other Joy Johnsons out there in the world, too, Fair if enough. I had taken a different path. Okay. Now, one of the things we, you know, I, certainly when I'm talking to students and people thinking, yeah. young, young people thinking about coming into this sort of career, um, they look at it and they see our lifestyle and they think about um, the amount of work, the amount of hours that we yeah. put in all this, but they don't see the other half, yeah. right, which is the real joy and the pleasure we get, yeah. but also the opportunities and things we do outside. So I wanted to ask you, right, set aside the Joy Johnson, he's yeah. the VPR and, yeah. and all this work, what do you do when you're not doing this? Well, um, I have fun. Okay, good. <laughs> Very important to me. Um, and, um, you know, so some of the things I do, um, I love the natural world, as I've mentioned. Yeah. Um, so to be out, uh, if, uh, you know, not in the waters here on the, on the West Coast, but in Hawaii snorkeling, that oh, okay. would be a dream for me to be, you know, in the water swimming, swimming in the yeah. I swim in the ocean in the summertime as okay. much as I can. Um, hiking, biking, that kind of physical out in the world is, right. a, a, in part, because I sit at a desk a lot. Sure. Um, love uh, my family and friends, cooking dinners for many people, drinking wine, good wine good only. Good wine, fair enough. Only okay. good wine. And just, No yeah. bias as to where that might have come from? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah not, did you hear about the, 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 the taking wine to, uh, uh, into space to see how it ages? Anyhow, that's a whole other oh, really? story. No, I didn't Unbelievable. Know that. that was on the news today. Anyhow, uh, yeah, so I mean, I feel I have a very full life. I love to read, um, uh, read all sorts of things, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, I feel okay. like I've got a very full life and a satisfying life. Great. Okay, so there's a question I do love to ask at the end of all of these interviews, yeah. right? 
And that is, if you had an opportunity to talk to anybody, I don't care when, how historically, or whatever, who would you talk to and why? It's interesting. Um, uh, I, I thought this question might be coming. Yes, and, I, yeah. and, and initially, I thought, oh, um, it should be re relevant to my career, and um, I might change my mind. No, I'm not going to change my mind about it. Um, I, I actually do believe that Florence Nightingale is the person I would be very interested in meeting. And, um, you know, she's considered the founder of modern nursing, and she was courageous. I mean, just imagine a woman, um, a very, you know, educated, um, upper class woman going out to the Crimea, uh, out to the war zone, right. um, and um, serving um, the soldiers who were wounded, but also a brilliant statistician. Um, I did not know that. Yes, a brilliant statistician, right. developed some of the very early statistical methods and never credited for that either. Right. Um, and also um, a public health genius, um, thinking about contagion, thinking about what needs to take place to help people be as healthy as possible. Right. Thinking about the environment, like wrote actively about the environment. So that I'm, you know, what made what made her be who she is, yeah. and so I, yeah, and I think she's very often misread and misunderstood. So she would be a person. Uh, and is that what you would ask her? What made her? Yeah, What's your like what you know? How did you how did you find your path? You know, right. um, and yeah. how did you think through the methods that you developed? I mean, that's right. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, fascinating. Mm -hmm. It won't happen, but it's you a never great know. question. It yes. is a great question. Joy, thank you so much. You're very for welcome. Us. My pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. Best of luck as you go to the next step, whatever it might be. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's it for another episode of On the Mic with Mike. I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you.